Okay. Well, I am delighted uh, that so many of you have joined me. Uh, and uh, I hope that you'll have some fun seeing a few things. Uh, there are a fair number of birds in Britain that we also have in this country, but there's also some that we don't have. So we're going to do a little, little of each. And um, um, I want to start out by saying that I have always been an Anglophile. Um, I, my first trip out of, um, out of college, I went to England. Um, my husband and I went to England all the time. Um, and so when my dear friends, Peggy and Bob Soar, were at Cambridge University where Bob was teaching. And when they invited me to come for a visit, they didn't have to twist my arm. Um, equally easy was to be able uh, to tie in visiting with Bob and Peggy uh, with uh, a little birding trip out to the uh, Nor Norfolk, the county of Norfolk, which is the Southeast uh, area of England. So um, here we go. Uh, everybody knows it's a nonstop flight from uh, Chicago there uh, to London. And then I jumped on a train and went straight north to Cambridge where Bob and Peggy were. When I was visiting, staying with them, uh, Peggy and I went up to Ely, which is up here. And then I went out on my own to this area, which is called Norfolk. This is the Southeast of England. Uh, Clay next to the sea was our farthest distant point. This is the North Sea. And right across from here is the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, so that's where we're, we're going to be. And uh, we're starting out um, uh, in Cambridge. And I have to say that Cambridge was a big surprise in many ways. It's, it's loaded with English charm. As you can see, the, the pubs, the half tendered, uh, timbered homes, the bicycles, the kids. Um, the university itself is the second oldest university in the English speaking world. And it's one of the most prestigious academic institutions in the world. It has amazing historic buildings, happy students that look like they ought to be in high school, not college, but they are no question about it, the creme de la creme of British youth and uh, a river that runs through it and beautiful countryside around it. What a great combination. Uh, this doesn't exactly look like a college town. That's Peggy's back right there. And here we are at Taddy's, which was Peggy's favorite restaurant in Cambridge. And here are the colleges. Now a college at Cambridge is where students live, eat and socialize and where they receive small group teaching sessions. Uh, it plays a far more significant part in the undergraduate's life than a residence hall does in a, in a US university. Uh, this, this is a college, this is Trinity College. How would you like to be going to school and living in a place like this? Here's King College, King's College. Here's Westminster College. Magdalen College, that's the way it's pronounced, not Magdalene. Uh, Samuel Pepys was its most famous alumnus. These are the punts, uh, the little boats that they uh, pull up and down the river Cam. And uh, the, Brit the Brits are great gardeners, just great gardeners. This wisteria just blew me away. I was there in May, which is a great time for birding everywhere uh, in the northern um, part of the world. Um, but this wisteria, I just had to show you. And so right there in Cambridge, we ran into probably the cutest bird in England. Uh, this is a robin. They call it robin. We call our robin an American robin. And the European name is European robin. So if going forward, when you see this name, this is the British name for the bird. This is the European or international name for the bird. And here's what it sounds like. They are simply the cutest birds in the world. And I do have to make a comment about our robin. This bird is about half the size of our robin. 
Um, and it's, uh, and our robin isn't really a robin, it's a thrush. The proper name for our robin used, should be a red-breasted thrush. But the first English people who came over here saw the red breasts and called it a robin mistakenly. And that incorrect name has stayed with it. Um, not only a cute bird, but it sings prettily too. I do want to say that the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds is the um, uh, main um, conservation organization for birds. This is the book that I used as a, a guide for some of the information. Uh, it is uh, published by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And um, uh, now when you go birding in England, you, you don't carry a field guide. A competent British birder knows his field marks and would be ashamed to have a book to confirm a bird's ID. This is explained by the fact that English, England has considerably fewer species than we have. There are presently about 285 species that breed in England and Ireland, plus an additional 24 migrants. By comparison, in North America, the American Birding Association checklist has over 1,100 entries. Today, I don't take a book field guide with me in the field uh, either, but I can carry four, um, four field guides on my cell phone, which is cell phones have revolutionized birding. Um, so this is the American tree sparrow. I do want to explain that uh, the RSPCB uh, uh, has uh, studied this, where the birds stand in, uh, in England. As you know, we've lost a lot of birds in this country, like about 25% of our birds in the last 50 years. They are much worse off in England. Uh, so throughout this talk, if the bird's name is in red, uh, it means that it's, it's seriously declining. Um, if the bird's name is green, it means it's really pretty much okay, uh, as the robin was in green. The robins are very, um, very prolific and, and are holding up pretty well. This uh, Eurasian tree sparrow is a European name, for, and here's the sound of the tree sparrow. We, we, we do have, um, I'll go back. We do have an American tree sparrow, not the same species. And then there is the house sparrow. Now the house sparrow is a somewhat contentious bird in the United States. It is originally uh, from England and it was brought to this country in the mid 1800s. Uh, the bird naturalized here and did very well. And within a hundred years, it had spread all the way to the West Coast. Uh, in the United States, it, not, it is not well loved because it's not a native bird and it's taking the niche and the food from our native birds. Um, anyway, uh, they are with us and in England, sadly, they are in serious decline. As you can see, they are, um, they are listed in red. So here's, oh, I guess I don't have a call on that one. Come on, Mr. House Sparrow. I guess I'm sorry, I don't. This is another bird, the starling, that was a, a British bird that was brought to the US. Um, it's it's um, been very successful in this country. And um, it, it once again, it's not well loved because it's not a native bird. Starlings have a lot of different calls. This is just one of them. So right there on the Cambridge uh, University uh, grounds, uh, there was a, a puddle with a moor hen. I, I love that. I always call this the candy cane beak. Speak to us, Mr. Moorhan. He's trying. I'm going to move along. There's another. Uh, and this is a, this was spring, as I said. This is a juvenile moran. There's a. Come on. There's the adult. It's just not going to play his song for you. I'm sorry to say. There's one with a piece of corn, juvenile. And then um, this is these are mallards. Um, they are the same mallard that we have in this country. 
This is dad and mom, and I think there's about eight eight babies, uh, seven. Um, these this they are not in danger in this country, as far as I know. Um, I, and I'm sorry the the um, calls are not playing. Um, we uh, then we went north, uh, 15 miles north of Cambridge to Ely. Uh, this particular um, city is known for its magnificent Norman Cathedral. Now this is not really supposed to be a tour of Ely, but it's such a beautiful building. I had to uh, take a few pictures. It is known as the ship of the fins. Uh, this is a small town, 18,000 people. And this is spectacular, uh, spectacular cathedral. And outside there are a few horses mowing the grass. This is not the usual manicured British landscape that you expect but it's still pretty charming out in the country. Up on a roof, we spotted a couple of birds there uh, near, the, near the cathedral. Uh, and I love the, I don't even know what that is, but uh, th they were wood pigeons. Uh, this is the British's, British uh, largest pigeon. Sounds vaguely like our morning dove. Uh, they came down to give us a better look. Uh, and then we spotted another bird, a, a lovely old building. And that turned out to be a blackbird. Now that is a different species than what we have in this country. And then we found a dunnock. This, this is what the Brits considered their garden birds. And, and they were just all hanging around. Uh, and this is a, th a song thrush. I had pictures of this bird, but my photos weren't very good. So Gina Nickel, uh, who is, is watching, uh, provided this photograph uh, for me. And Gina is the owner and main leader for Sunrise Birding, which is my favorite tour company. Here's the song thrush's call. It's a, it's a lo lovely song. Lovely song. And, and it's, a, it's a very pretty bird that we do not have the equal of. So we were in Ely at the open air market and I just thought I'd show you because this is so typically British. Those loaves of bread look pretty good. That's my friend Peggy. And uh, I love this sign, handmade pies and pasties using traditional lard pastry. To choose from traditional pork pies, duck and orange, royal game, Gloucester, old spot with pickle, Stilton venison, chili jam, anyway, yada, yada, yada. And these people supply Harrods and Fortnum and Masons, two of the top stores in London. Anyway, so we were out in the out about area and we saw a great tit. Now the tits are the British version of our chickadees. And there are several different kinds of tits. Uh, this one is a great tit and notice that it's in green. So these guys are very pretty and doing very well. And look at that nice foliage about to, to burst into. He looks, uh, he, he's got yellow on him, which our, um, our chickadees don't have, obviously. Uh, this is a blue tit, very acrobatic blue tit. This one is upside down. That's a better shot of him. And a long tailed tit. Kind of a buzzy little call. This is the coal tit that comes the closest to looking like our chickadee. But as you can hear, if, you, if you're familiar at all with our chickadee, it doesn't sound anything like our chickadee. And of course, the Latin is completely different. This is our, our black capped chickadee, just for comparison. 
and that's the Latin for for this for our our chickadee. I don't know if I have a call. I'm sorry. I I don't think I put a call. This is this is the British wren, uh, and, and it is just known as a wren. Uh, they are estimated to be a, 11 million pairs of this bird in Britain. This is a rook. These are strange uh, blackbirds with his funny um, forehead. And this is a jackdaw. This is a typical a British bird. Once again, happy to see that name in green. Has a complete a white iris. Uh, another very uh, popular bird uh, in England and a common garden bird is a chaffinch. And I remember saying something about how beautiful the little, the little daisies were in the grass. And of course they consider them weeds, but the birds seem to like them. That's what chaffinch sounds like. He was having a perfectly lovely time among the weeds. There, I caught one singing. Um, and then this was a very common woodpecker. They're great spotted woodpecker. Happy to see that name in green. He's, he's probably the closest they come to our uh, US hairy woodpecker, um, but they're not at all like, this is a much, be much bigger, much bigger bird. Also notice the red vent on this uh, great spotted woodpecker. pretty good chatter. And then we ran across a magpie. Uh, this is the Brits. We, we tend to have two names with our birds. Like we have a magpie in the US called the black-billed magpie. Theirs is a ma magpie. And, and the European name is black-billed magpie. It's pika pika. It's not the same magpie that we have in the US. Here's what he sounds like. He was marching around the grounds looking so, so splendid. That's a wonderful tale. Okay, so um, Peggy and I went back to Ely and I then went um, barreling out, of, out to the town of Norwich. Uh, Norwich, this whole area is the Normandy area. And uh, I stayed in a little B&B &B here outside Norwich and teamed up with some birders. Uh, one of the first places we went was to Wesselton Heath. And uh, as I said, it was spring. This was uh, the gorse in bloom. I'd been hearing about gorse all my life and I just thought it was thorny and awful, but it was actually very pretty stuff. And it was everywhere. This was the British guide. And the linnet was posing nicely in the gorse. Okay, so so this is this is the amber list uh, for the Brits uh, that says that it's it's a falling population or it may be may be stabilizing now. Uh, this particular bird. This was a yellow hammer, uh, unfortunately, and the red. And we ran across a tree creeper, which is, is a similar to a brown creeper that we have in this country, but it's not. And uh, happily, these are doing very well in England. I call some of you might not pick it up. Our, our brown creeper sounds similar, I have to say, but not exactly the same. So next, next we went to Minsmere wetlands and reed beds. These were on the North Sea coast. We're now in Suffolk County. And that's of course the reeds. And we ran across a couple of 
gray log geese um, at uh, uh, RSPB's men's mirror. This is, there's the little baby. It's a rather pretty goose, I thought. And uh, we found some black-headed gulls at Midsmere. Only the Brits could name a brown-headed gull a black-headed gull. <laughs> They're very handsome, very handsome gulls. Our most common gull around here is a ring bill gull or a herring gull. But these are very smart looking fellows. And then we uh, were able to photograph a tufted duck, um, obviously named for that little signature, um, little bit of feathering off the back of his head. And uh, this is a weed ear. This is a bird that had just arrived the day we arrived. Uh, the, the Brit that we went out with said that they hadn't been here the day before we went out. So they, this bird would have just returned from Northern Africa. Um, and here's what he sounds like. This weed ear is the British name. Northern weed ear is the European name. He was a cute fellow. He was really very cute and he posed nicely for me. And also very common uh, was the yellow wagtail. <laughs> and um, this is, uh, we had a foggy morning this day, as you can tell. Um, the uh, the hides uh, are where you go to the shelters where you go to try to watch the birds without interrupting them. This is the British call this bird a swallow. Uh, this is indeed the same as our same bird as our U.S. barn swallow. Uh, there were a pair of them sitting on. The public footpath sign I thought was pretty cute. And just another shot of the Herundo rustica. So now we're up at clay next to the sea, which is the farthest north point that I showed you on the map. And we ran across a coot. Um, now we have coots in this country. Uh, they look considerably different than this coot. Uh, the main difference is this big white shield here. This guy has got a red eye, which our American coots have as well. Um, this is there he was going into the reeds. Once again, that big white shield. And here's our American coot, just for comparison. It still has a bit of a white shield, but it's topped with black. And, and the bird is not as long in the body as, as the British coot. So we were having lunch uh, at a picnic table and this uh, pheasant came up. Uh, British name is pheasant. Um, European name is common pheasant. And we call it a ringneck pheasant. Whatever you call it, it's a, it, it is non-native to the US. They were all brought in from Asia. They aren't native to England either, but they are simply beautiful birds. The, the, um, they are just stunning birds, as you can see. The coloration of the male is amazing. And then that is the very, very plainly colored female. Um, and of course that's, primarily because the female is doing most of the incubating of the eggs on the nest and needs to be um, cryptic, uh, invisible as much as possible. But she was pretty in her own way. But he was a stunner. And we found a Peter Rabbit. It's good to know that they have Peter Rabbits. 
this was my group. It was a couple of, these were a couple of Americans and this was a Brit. This was the guy, he was not a great personality boy. I have to say of all the great birding guys I've known, I dislike this guy the most. Uh, but it was fun to, to get around and see the various areas. And without him, I wouldn't have known how to do it. Now uh, we're going to uh, the marshes, the clay. And uh, this is one that put me off a little bit. Swarovski is one of the top manufacturers of, of uh, scopes and binoculars. And they built these hides for the British. I haven't seen Swarovski building any hides for us in our country. Anyway, this is what a hide looks like. And, uh, and that's the view. Well, unfortunately, there wasn't very much to be seen out there. Oh, there's a few dots, but uh, not, not good for photography. But um, I've, I've often wondered why the British got so many good, so many good structures for bird watching from, from uh, to the British. Oh, well. Anyway, so here we did find an oyster catcher. Um, and uh, once again, the Eurasian, uh, the European name is Eurasian oyster catcher. These guys uh, use that long red beak for getting uh, mussels and cockles. And if he speaks, this is what he says. Here were a pair of oyster catchers. And now we started hiking on the shingle. This is called shingle in England or a shingle beach. It is worse than anything to walk on that I can have ever been involved in, except some, some serious uh, mud. Uh, this, it, it's just loose rocks and it is it's extensive and we hiked on it forever. It was misery. But this was walking along this and looking for birds was when we found this World War II pill. There were several World War II pillboxes. Uh, they, I guess they're just so solid, they just didn't bother to take them out. Of course, they're, they're looking right at the North Sea, which is heading, was right across from Germany. So um, they're probably fairly well fortified. And out there, we found a skylark. Uh, beautiful skylark uh, and uh, they are what they do is they they go straight up and they sing and they stay up very high and then they come right back down on the post and what they when they do that this is what they sound like they're, they're, they're much beloved in England, and as you can see by the red uh, on the name of the bird, they are they're declining badly, unfortunately. Uh, we were pleased to run across some lapwings. These are a pretty fancy bird that if any of you watched um, my Lesbos uh, pictures, we would have had these. Uh, they have a nice iridescence on their um, on their shoulder. And then this lovely tufty feather, this of course is a male and uh, they are declining seriously in England. We also had these lapwings, I'm not sure if it's the same lapwing down in um, Brazil. This is, this is the kind of area that we were birding in with the reed beds, a hide, the shingle, and then the North Sea. And then uh, th these somehow or other, these, the saline lagoons become saltier than the sea, which is probably why we didn't see very many birds over here. Um, not quite sure. This, this is the shingle building up and then coming down to this. I think this water gets trapped here and doesn't get replenished, so it probably gets saltier. Anyway, uh, we did find a gadwall. This is exactly the same duck that we have in the US. And then we ran across some avocets. These are um, wonderful, wonderful birds. These are 
uh, I think they're pied. They, well, the Brits call anything that's black and white as pied. So these are avocets, and um, they they use this upturned uh, uh, beak to swish through the water to get aquatic invertebrates that they eat. And it's the the European name is pied avocet. You can see how very fine that beak is. Look at the almost bluish legs. And, and imagine having to preen your feathers when you have that sort of a beak. But this is, the next shot is the way I usually saw the avocets. That's my usual avocet view. Um, they, of course, that's what they do for a living is try to find something to eat. So uh, this, um, this was a black-tailed godwit that I just caught a quick shot of before it disappeared. Uh, he he is a summer uh, he's a summer resident. Uh, I'm sorry, he's a winter resident, and he he wasn't supposed to still be here anyway. They were pleased to have seen him. And then we got to Minsmere, uh, where we saw this wonderful bearded tit. Uh, this is about the only place I saw them in England. And um, we found some shovelers. Now, um, this is exactly the same bird that we have in the US. Uh, the British, of course, call it shovelers. We call it a northern shoveler. And the Europeans call it northern shovelers. Uh, there's a reason why they call them northern shovelers is because of that beak. There were a bunch of them and uh, I just love this. You can tell it's spring. What are there? One, two, three, four, five of them following one female. I just liked seeing this shot. This guy just had a little bath and I wanted to show you close up. So here they were resting on some little islands. The shovelers out uh, and the, the avocets were back here. And back here I think is a gray log goose. And that was the countryside now, um, much prettier back here. Here's, here's the gorse in bloom and then way back there is the North Sea. So you have to love the British names. Here's Strumpshaw Finn. And here's what it looks like. And lo and behold, we found a willow warbler. Now this is, you know, in the US, our warblers are extremely beautiful, very, very brightly colored and, and elegant. The, the European warblers are very, very subtle coloring. And now I'm not saying this isn't a pretty bird, but it's just subtle. And now we're at Randworth Broad. And no more shingle to walk on, thank goodness. And we found this wonderful great crested grebe. This is a perfectly beautiful bird. I hope you can see her beak is here, a nice red eye, a big crest, and right on her back is a baby. And of course, this is her nest right out in the water. And the good news is that these birds are doing very well. The, the, the name is Green. And the little baby has moved across around to the front. And now you can see that there's actually two little babies. These aren't the world's greatest shots, but it was a pretty good distance for me. And here's the male of out swimming. It's just gorgeous feathering. Showing off his stuff. And then we found a shell duck. Uh, this was, um, a stunning looking bird. We don't have these in the States at all. And 
And then we found a pied wagtail, uh, which European way is called a white. Remember I said, Brits call a black and white bird pied. So um, this was on a little retaining wall. And that's what he sounded like. And uh, they've discovered wind turbines, unfortunately. Uh, so I just took a picture of them to prove that they're there. And then we ran across, this is one of the prettiest birds, um, a reed bunting. Um, and, and he is in breeding plumage and he's, he's just determined to keep that branch between me and him. Here's another shot, same branch. So I, I, did, I did take a, a picture off the internet to show you what the bird really looks like. Uh, and they're, they're in the gold or the amber, so they're doing pretty well. Now at a feeder, a local feeder, uh, we ran across a couple of uh, goldfinches, a, a couple of feeder birds. Uh, the lower left is a goldfinch, British name, European goldfinch, European name, and a greenfinch. Now, this goldfinch is um, has has some some goldfinch European goldfinches are British goldfinch have naturalized in this Chicagoland area. Um, but just for fun, I will show you uh, what he sounds like. And then just for comparison, our American goldfinch. They're just as unlike as, as night and day. Um, which is fun. And we saw a tree pipit uh, at quite a distance. And a spotted flycatcher. Once again, they have a way of always getting part of the foliage between me and the camera and him. And I couldn't leave without showing you a, a jay. This is such a pretty bird and so different from our jay. Um, that's our blue, our blue jay. And of course, our blue jays are mimics. They have so many different calls, you never know what, what it is. So more reed beds. And we finally found a wild mute swan. And right near the mute swan. And then we found a mute swan with a whole bunch of little babies. And that successfully round up our birding trip of Norfolk. Um, oops, I forgot about this little guy. We managed to catch a barn owl. So it's the same barn owl that we have in the States and they are gorgeous. Thanks for watching uh, a few British birds with me and um, I hope you enjoyed yourselves. That's it folks. I thought it'd be longer. Please feel free to put questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself too. Now, am I gone, Gina? You are not gone, Mary Lou, you're there. I can't, I can't see myself. So. That was fabulous, Mary Lou. Oh, brought me, brought me home. <laughs> Very Thank nice, you. Mary Lou. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. So say hello, Mary Lou. I'm here too, Mary Lou. I know, Peggy, and I'm glad you're there. Great trip. Yes, it was. Thanks to you guys for letting me come and visit. Because I'd never done any birding in England before. So, And this is obviously not every bird in England by any means. You got a lot. Well, 
we tr I tried. Anybody got any questions? Mary Lou, there's a couple of questions in chat for you. Um, what is causing the birds to be on the endangered list? Well, um, you know, the that's one of the things that RSPCB, RSPB is trying to figure out. Uh, mostly everybody feels that it is uh, habitat loss, which of course, you know, we've practically paved everything. And if we've paved things in this country, the Brits have paved more of their country than we've paid in ours. The other thing is the use of neonicotinoids uh, as pesticides. Uh, if you kill the pests, that's what the birds are eating. Uh, or you poison the birds because the, the birds eat the poison. So, um, you know, it, it, is, it is a lot uh, that uh, I think the combination of those two things, plus climate change. If, if, the, if the things warm up too soon, the birds haven't migrated or the birds, um, th then there isn't anything for them to eat on. Uh, it, 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 there's a lot of serious problems for birds these days. And um, it's, it, 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 I'm not so sure it's anything we can solve, but we sure need to try. Someone wants to know if there's anything being done to help the birds in Great Britain. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, this 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 uh, publication by the um, RSPB is that's what they're in business for uh, is to try to help the birds. So um, you know, I, I that was beyond the scope of my talk. Uh, the, the reason the reason the RSPB uh, was established was back in uh, I think the late 1890s, something like that, when. Uh, the feather trade, which was people uh, grabbing birds for their feathers and then turning them over to the millinery trade. And the milliners were making these fancy hats in England and in the US for women to wear with feather plumes and or wings of birds on their hats or, um, uh, or even whole birds on the hats. And it was destroying, it almost destroyed 40 species of waterfowl in this country. So uh, what does the RSPB do? They do a lot. And they did uh, have done a lot since they, uh, and it was a couple of Boston socialites uh, in this country who put a stop to the feather trade and to, to using uh, feathers on, on women's hats. So uh, that, that would have done in um, a, a huge number of birds if it hadn't happened. But I, I do not know all the things that the RSPB does but they are the largest uh, conservation organization, I think in the world for at least certainly in England. Um, so yeah. And someone wants to know, are wind turbines bad for birds and are feathers banned in England for fishing lures? I, I don't know the answer to the fishing lure story. Um, the problem with wind turbines is that wind turbines have to be placed where the wind is. And the birds use the wind to migrate. So um, th that's a terrible problem. Uh, you know, there's out in California, there's that pass where there's about 50,000 wind turbines and, and, and all the hawks go right through that pass. I think they've got it now where most of those turbines get stopped during migration. But yeah, wind turbines, even though they're reasonably, they look reasonably slow, they really aren't that slow. And uh, the birds can, they can do a lot of birds in. Um, there's a question here. Lovely birds. Thanks for sharing. Where is your next trip destination? Now, I'm not sure if she means trip as in a program at the library or where you're going to go next, but I know you're coming back Monday, April 19th at one o'clock for Birding Columbia, if you want to mention that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I am doing Birds of Columbia. This was um, a marvelous trip doing the east and west slopes of the western Andes, the central Andes, and the west uh, eastern Andes, and it was it was a lot of birds. This is right after Colombia opened up and uh, the rebels started behaving themselves. Uh, there were just three of us plus a guide. It was a wonderful trip, and there's some wonderful birds in that. Uh, and I have been grounded for the last year. I absolutely am going bonkers trying to get out of town on a birding trip. Um, and I am, I've, I've told Gina Nickel that I'm 
almost any trip she can get going. So, but I'm hoping to either go to Borneo or to go to Spain. So um, the Spain trip is run uh, by a guy that works for Gino, who's an absolutely wonderful birder. He's a laugh riot. Plus he, he, he loves to dine well. So I think that would be a, a wonderful trip. Um, but Borneo is, is t I, I love tropical birding and Bor Borneo is kind of on my hot list. And Gina's doing that in April for, for Prospect Heights Public Library. So I'll be watching that with you all. Uh, right, she'll be with us Thursday, April 29th at seven o'clock for Borneo's Wildlife Paradise. Yep, indeed. So around here, uh, you know, spring is fabulous in Chicago for birding. Starve Rock is, Starve Rock is wonderful. Skokie Lagoons is fabulous. The Prospect Heights Slough is fabulous in May. Um, uh, there, there, aren't a, there aren't enough days in the month of May to do all the birding I wanna do. So at least, at least I have that to make up for having lost the whole past year. Someone mentioned that they read a book called The Father Thief that goes into the great detail about how bird feathers were used in the garment industry. And you can probably get that book at our library, The Father Thief. Yes, I'm sure, you know, when I was reading about it, it, it is almost gruesome what they did. Uh, they would just wade into rookeries of birds and just, I don't even want to talk about it. Um, so uh, fortunately that was put an end to. And I don't know about fishing lures. Um, I, 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 I can't answer that. Story. I can't answer that question. Just, Someone wants to know if you do a program on the birds of Galapagos. Well, um, unfortunately, when I was in the Galapagos, I wasn't much of a photographer. Uh, so I, I have a hard time doing it. Uh, it's very limited. The Galapagos is a wonderful experience. But what they've got is what they've got. There aren't a whole lot of migratory birds that go because the Galapagos are way the heck out in the Pacific Ocean off Ecuador, as I recall. Um, so I, I really can't do a Galapagos program without just using a bunch of other people's, um, other people's photos. Um, but I sure recommend that as a trip to you if you ever get to travel again. And Gina is asking, what was the name of your local guide? I, I have forgotten. I didn't, I didn't like him. <laughs> I, I, um, I found him. I'm not even sure how I found him. But I, 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 the, the two Americans and I both didn't go out the, the last day with him. That's how much we disliked him. So <laughs> you don't want to hire him, Gina. <laughs> it should have been Steve Bird. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> wouldn't that have been wonderful? Oh, wow. Yeah. Steve Bird is a wonderful birder, great, talented um, artist, and, and a wonderful bird leader who works with Gina. And um, yeah, I wish it had been Steve Bird. Of course, I probably would never have come home from England. Anything, anybody else? I don't see anything else, Mary Lou. Thank you so much. And we look forward to going to Columbia on April 19th. All right. Um, and we can all get out and bird watch right now. The weather is so wonderful. So yes, thank get you. Get out there and enjoy this wonderful day, folks. And thank you for spending an hour of your time with me. I really